Good morning, good afternoon, good evening in whatever time zone you are. Welcome to the UNESCO IHE uh, online seminar for alumni. Uh, this is the fourth seminar that we organize in a series that hopefully extends many years to come. And this fourth seminar is dedicated to our new alumni, the group that graduated just last month. And not quite incidentally, the speaker today is an example of the group that graduated today. But first, two, uh, two, two small comments. Um, we try to involve you using a little question-answer session called Kahoot, for which you have hopefully read that you are to download a little app on your mobile or tablet called Kahoot that allows you to answer the questions that we show you on the monitor. Uh, secondly, it is also possible to ask your own questions uh, to the speaker by either uh, Twitter on the account of hashtag, oof, uh, hashtag alumni OS and the word alumni and OS from online seminar is with capital letters or you can send that by uh, email to alumni at unescoihe.org. So, two ways of interacting with the speaker. Um, today, who is the speaker? That is actually Oscar Soto Reyes, just graduated. Uh, he is a civil engineer, initially graduated from the Technical University of Panama holding an MSc degree in Management of Logistics and Transportation from Chalmers University of Technology in Gothenburg, Sweden. Uh, moreover, here in IHE uh, Delft, UNESCO IHE Delft, he has recently obtained his master's degree in Coastal Engineering and Port Development. Um, Oscar is a well-experienced person in the field, 15 years of experience in governmental and private sectors, as well as in the field of inspection, consultancy, and management of construction contracts. But what we are talking uh, today is the most important part of his experience. Since 2009, Oscar works in several uh, qualities on the expansion of the Panama Canal, obviously, in Panama. And that precisely is the topic of his presentation today, which is Panama Canal expansion, building the future, and honoring the past. And with that, Oscar, you have the pleasure of giving your presentation. Thank you very much for the, such a nice introduction, Martin. So welcome everyone, good day, and welcome to this webinar, Panama Canal expansion, building the future, honoring the past. We will follow the agenda as, as shown in the slide. We will start with uh, some location and key figures about the Republic of Panama. Then we will uh, touch upon the Chagres River Basin development and the importance for the Panama Canal. Then we will jump into the Panama Canal expansion program, emphasizing three the three main features of the project, namely the concrete structures, the filling and emptying system, and the lock gates. In addition to that, we will also uh, approach some operational issues and so new features of the third set of locks. And we will conclude with some final remarks. <coughs> the Republic of Panama, location and key figures. The Republic of Panama is located in Central America and uh, with neighbors Colombia to the east and Costa Rica to the west. And we have the Caribbean side to the north and the Pacific Ocean to the south that brings the country with more than 3,000 linear kilometers of shorelines. Also, we are 4 million inhabitants living there and uh, in a surface of 75,000 square kilometers. The most important thing about the economic uh, development is, like, is that since 2009 we have had a sustained yearly growth of more than 7% per, per uh, GDP. So, the Republic of Panama, if we zoom a little bit out from the previous slide, 
we, we can see that we are located just in the waist of the American continent and in the crossroads between the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. So and then, since the emergence of the isthmus from the oceans, we have, we have been by nature the link between the Americas and between the two oceans. So it is not just a matter of, of, uh, of, uh, of geological, a geological granted resource, which is the location, but it's also driven by the global commerce and maritime train, trade, especially. So, since as we have seen before, we 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 will speak a little bit about the Panama Canal. But for this presentation specifically, we will emphasize the importance of the Chagres River Basin development. So, as we saw, maritime trade and commerce were the main drivers to to encourage the different people at, at different uh, eras to find a crossing and a link between the two seas, a path between the two seas. So since 1524, when the King Charles V of Spain ordered the first studies to analyze the feasibility of a, of a canal linking the two oceans, then it, 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 it wasn't feasible by then, but what they did implement indeed was the first multimodal route linking the two oceans using the Chagres River as the inland waterway transport mean and complementing it with a road a road path all the way to the Pacific side. Afterwards, ma many many years after indeed, in 1849 the gold mines were discovered in San Francisco, California. So that prompted another, another mode of transportation across the isthmus of Panama, namely the, the first Transistmian railway that was built in between the years 1855 and 1885. But then, in 1889, Ferdinand de Lesseps, the builder of the Suez Canal, also came to the Isthmus with the intention of, with a new for a new adventure to build a level canal across the Isthmus. However, tropical diseases and some maladministration uh, didn't allow him to complete his enterprise. So in 1903, the U.S. took over the project, and when they did that, they had to reassess the engineering. So they they were facing two different engineering options, may, namely either digging down the earth and the continental divide to to continue with the Lesseps project as a level canal, or rising the waters. So rising the chips to an artificial lake to be built and then to, to, to cross the isthmus in that way. So after many analysis they came out with the final solution of raising the waters and using the Chagres River as, as the, the main component of the, the project, dam, damming the river twice with Gatun Dam near the mouth of the river on the Atlantic side and with Madden Dam upstream. And in that way, they created the then the biggest artificial lake in the world that held that record until the construction of Hoover Dam in the US. So with the, with the rising the water solution, the, the US managed to solve and to, to tackle the three main problems of a water, of, of, a, of a level, canal which is which are avoiding the tidal currents tidal currents because on the pacific side the tidal range um, namely the difference between high tide and low tide is seven meters whereas on the atlantic side that difference is only one meter the second the second uh, issue they they <coughs> they managed to solve with the rise in the water solution was the avoiding density currents what, what are density currents? Imagine a huge inflow of tropical fresh water from Chagres River getting into the sea at both sides at once. Then it, it creates currents that might, might not be good for navigational purposes. And then, and probably the most important one, is like 
by rising the waters, the U.S. avoided 10 extra years of excavation works across the continental divide that would have rendered the, the, the project unfeasible back then. So what they did, basically, they dammed the Chagres River twice at Katum Dam near the mouth of the river on the Atlantic Ocean or the Caribbean seaside and at upstream at Madden, Madden Lake just as a, as a redundant redundancy for the system. So basically, if you, if you can see here in the, this profile, this is the amount of excavation work they avoided and this is the final engineering configuration they came up with Gatun Locks three steps on the Atlantic side, then they created by Gatun Dam, they created the then, back then, the biggest artificial lake in the world, and that was until the building of the Hoover Dam in the US. And afterwards, they built the three, uh, three other steps to get down to the Pacific side, and, and Mira, at Pedro Miguel, one step, then Miraflores Lake, which is a buffer lake between the Pacific and the Gatun Lake, and then the two last steps going south of Miraflores Locks. Just quickly reviewing the Madum da, uh, Gatun Dam is the most important, it's the core of the project. That this structure is the one we cannot afford to lose or to 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 be broken by any by by any reason. Is it, it will take us plus in addition to the construction of the new dam two extra years to fill in the lake, and that depends also on the climate change. So it's not only Gatun Dam that is related to this project. It's also Madden Dam upstream Chagres River that holds Madden Lake, which is the source of the potable water for Panama City, the biggest uh, water treatment plant takes the water from Madden Lake and not from Gatun Lake. And then we have Miraflores Dam that holds Miraflores Lake, the buffer we spoke about before. So summarizing this video, imagine we are sailing from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific, then we, the ships sail through the three steps, nine, nine meters more or less, and then they sail up on um, Gatun Lake. Then they go, they sail across Gailar Cot or Culebra Cot, which is the continental divide. Then one step down at Pedro Miguel, then they enter into the Miraflores Lake, and then they get two steps down at, Mira, at Miraflores, and then they get into the ocean. Quiz time. Okay, thanks, Oscar. We take over, and we are now going to ask you the questions that you quickly saw already just a minute ago, but to which you can answer on your own mobile or tablet. So the system is loaded. There we go. Um, get your tablet, and are you ready to join? Put in that is easy. Okay, uh, so we have already four people in the system. Please put in your uh, name, most specifically preceded by the uh, game pin that you have to put into your mobile. And now we see the number of people coming. We wait for maybe a few more seconds uh, until we have already six people coming in. So folks, please uh, take that number into your tablet or computer, uh, assuming that you have uploaded the uh, Kahoot um, app and then we go and start with the first question that was ready for you and they're coming one out of five if we go to all question is what is the name of the river that allowed the construction of the panama canal and you just push one of the colors or one of the names that you think is the correct one and then we go from there 
and you still have 20 minutes, 20 seconds, sorry, uh, to finalize this first question. It was mentioned by Oscar in his presentation. And then you, Oscar, you will release the right answer, correct? Yep. The right answer is the red one, Chagres River, indeed. Okay. There you go. The floor is yours again. Yes. So now we are jumping into the Panama Canal exp expansion program itself. So, first, the rationality behind the expansion. Why? The reason. And basically, two reasons. Progress and economies of scale. As uh, you can see in the white, black and white picture here, this is the, the steamer Ancon, the, the first transit of 1914 Panama Canal. And you can see the dimensions compared to the log chambers uh, structures. However, if you see the colorful picture to, the, to your right, you can see two Panamax ships transiting the, the 1914 locks at its full capacity. We had reached already 95% of our capacity. And those ships that you see in the picture were transiting with only 60 centimeters at either side from the, from the, lock, wall, from the lock chamber walls. So as you could imagine, the maritime industry and the global economy all around the world didn't wait for us to expand the Panama Canal and since 1997 the new generation of post Panama ships started to be built and even bigger and bigger every single year so we needed to expand so it was not only a single project it was a program because the program consisted in, of five main components the first one is the widening and the deepening of the both the Atlantic and entrance entrance channels. The second one, and probably the flagship of the program, is the construction of the third set of locks, two complexes, one on the Atlantic, one on the Pacific. Then we also needed to widen and deepen and the Gatun Lake and Culebra Cut navigational channels. And of course, we needed more water to operate the new locks. So we also had to raise the maximum operational level of Gatun Lake from 26.7 to 27.13 meters. And fifth, but not the least, we also had to build a new access channel on the Pacific side, because as we saw previously, the first 1914 Panama Canal on the Pacific side, because of the topography, was built in a two steps plus one step configuration, whereas for the third set of locks, the three steps were, got, were to be built in one single complex. Just a little bit about the money, cost of today and financing, the total cost of the program was 5.4 billion US dollars, of which funded by the Panama Canal Authority uh, from our revenues, it was 3.5 3.1 billion US dollars and financing institutions gave us loans for uh, amounting 2.3 billion US dollars in the slide we can see the main five multilateral uh, agencies that lent us the money and in a nutshell just to 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 give the audience a rough order of magnitude about the quantities and the volumes of the of the program Excavation and dredging of the of the expansion program is more than was more than 150 million cubes. That it, it will be enough to fill 75 Amsterdam Arena. It's like a soccer, a soccer, an Olympic soccer stadium. In terms of concrete structures, the contractor poured more more than four million metric metric cube, cubic meters. That is enough to fill more than 1147 swimming olympic pools and in terms of reinforcing steel we the contractor installed more than 236,000 tons uh, equaling more or less to 32 eiffel towers and the structural steel used for the lock gates and the valves to control the flow of the water amounted 
60,000 tons, more or less, eight Eiffel Towers. This is just a, a rough idea of the magnitudes we were dealing with in the project. So, third set of lots is the flagship of the, of the program, as we mentioned before. However, the design and build contractor was the same. The two complexes were different because on the Atlantic side, the alignment allo will allow for a potential fourth set of locks to be mirrored to the east, as we can see here. And whereas on the Pacific side, the alignment will allow for a potential fourth set of locks mirroring it to the west. And in terms of geology, the Atlantic side was marked by, by sedimentary sandstones and limestones, which were fully excavated by only means, mechanical means. Whereas on the Pacific side, this is Atlantic, on the Pacific side, as you can see here, the geology had igneous columnar basalt, which, which really required the use of drilling and blasting. The good thing of drilling and blasting on the Pacific side was that that basalt was used by the contractor to produce the full range of aggregates and sand for the, for the concrete structures. So, another quiz time. Martin? Okay, happy to take over. Uh, because there were so many numbers that you just saw and here you can express how much you remembered how many swimming pools and you see the dimensions of the swimming pool could be filled with the concrete of the third set of locks and you have again four choices to push on and then we see what the best answer is according to Oscar. 10 seconds more for your answer. You're pushing. There you go. Your time is up. Oscar, what's the answer? Answer. The correct answer is B. 1150 Olympic swimming pools. So, let's continue. Let's now speak a little bit of the concrete structures. But first, we will speak a little bit on the dimensions of the chambers and the vessels. There are many, many there are literature about the Panamax dimensions of the vessels, but I will just roughly tell you that the maximum capacity was a little bit more of 4,000 TEUs or 4,000 container boxes. But for the main, for the for the third set of lock chambers, the dimensions were much bigger. Indeed, the new vessel size was called Neo Panamax, Neo Panamax vessels. So with, but the dimensions are much easier to remember than the Panamax. I will tell you why. Because just think about a leap year. A leap year has 366 days. So that's the length of the Neo Panamax ship, 366 meters. Just, just in the same leap year, February has 29 days, right? So the middle day of February is the 15th of February, 15th of the second month. So 15.2 is the maximum depth of that chip. And do you remember the, the discovery of the gold mines in, Cali in Cali San Francisco, California? It was in 1849. Well, 49 meters is the maximum width of the maximum width of the new Panama ship. So 360 meters length. 15.2 meters deep and then 49 meters width. So, concrete structures. 1914 Panama Canal. As you can see in these two pictures, especially the left one, only massive concrete was used. So that means that no steel bars were embedded into the concrete. O everything was massive and everything was just compacted by means of el some electrical vibrators or even by human force, as you can see here in the picture. On the on your right, you will see also another picture showing the different leaves or different steps of the concrete pools. And you cannot see whatsoever looking like a reinforcing steel bar going, going through the structures. 
Two more pictures about the methods that were used by the US to, to put the concrete into the structures. They use railways mainly, and they use railway buckets and railway mixers, and they, use, they also made use of cable ways to put concrete into the structures. Once more, we cannot see and we will not see any steel rebar coming out the leaves. And then, this is the third set of locks project. And what you can see here, m a huge amount of concrete, of sorry, of steel. And why? Because it's not that the seismic conditions have changed, but the seismic design requirements have changed over 100 years. So that's why the design build contractor really had to install such amount of, of, of steel for seismic design considerations. And of course, you can see here, this is an example of the congestion that also brought an additional challenge to the contractor to develop the right concrete mixes. Up to 10 different classes of concrete were designed and were poured into the project. And of course, for such a massive project, the contractor had to work 24 seven, only using the Sundays to give maintenance to the batching plants. And, but all the other days, he poured up to 6,000 cubic meters per day in one site. So the final product, the deliverables. So we can see here the lock chambers. The idea of these two slides is to show you a little bit of the structures that Hopefully, when you visit Panama and you will visit the Panama Canal, you won't be able to see because everything is underwater now. So these are the lock chambers. You can see the full, the the two fender lines that give you an idea of the step nine meters between two of them, and the lateral ports of the concrete structures. And then we can see here what we call the lock heads or the recesses where the gates are, are kept when they are not in use. Or to allow the chips to transit from chamber to chamber. Another two important structures are the inlet structures, which take the water from the Gatun Lake, and the outlet structures, which uh, spill the water into the oceans. So, another quiz time. Martin. And there we go again, following up on your wonderful set of numbers and impressive presentation. Question number three. How many swimming pools, and you see the dimensions, could be filled with the concrete of the third set of locks? It should be the next one. Yeah, I'm a bit surprised. This one? Yeah, yeah. Okay, here we go. We had the wrong one, apparently. Uh, what are the dimensions of the Neo Panamax vessels? And you have four, three choices of the vessel sizes. Which one is the correct one? And after 18 seconds more, Oscar is going to tell us what these huge machines or how huge the machines are that can actually pass through. Time is up. Oscar, tell us. Well, the answer is the yellow one. 366 meters was the key figure there. Wow. See. So, let's continue. Then let's jump into the hydraulic system or the filling and emptying systems. 1914 Panama Canal. As we can see here, these are the culverts or the, the, the transporting the water for the 1914 Panama Canal. But let's put a special attention to the how they, the system fills and empties the lock chambers, which is through the bottom or the floor of the lock chambers, right? As we can see here. Another interesting point of view here is the step. This step is more or less the nine meters step that uh, the, the chips either go up or go down in every lockage. However, in the, for the third set of locks, the idea was 
an innovation to use water saving basins or in other simple words some really huge pools to recycle the water when it, wherever, whenever it was necessary to recycle especially during the dry seasons so the system basically was required to provide savings of minimum 60% of the water use so imagine there is a chip that is going down so how the system should work and it's working currently is 20% 20, 20 goes for the first pool the second 20% goes to the second pool the third 20% goes to the third pool and then that makes 60% saving or recycling and then the other 40% is spilled into the ocean let's do the reverse process because also the chips have to go up so the first 20% is filled from the first pool the second 20% is filled from the second pool the third 20% is filled from the third pool and then the other 40% is taken from the lake there are many presentations around that only briefly speak to you about 7% that the new structures use 7% less water than the old ones and of course the logical question is like how can how can it be because the structures are much bigger the water volume is much bigger the chips are much bigger so this is the answer I we made this uh, spreadsheet a small spreadsheet ourselves the key figure is here is the 40% that is actually lost to the sea for every ship that makes that the total volume of water using for every ship to transit the Panama the new locks is 93% of the total volume used for one ship transiting the old locks so that 7% that you will see in many other presentations comes from this calculation so once more this is the one of the new chambers this you see the two line of fenders that's more or less nine meters distance and this is the total the hundred percent of the volume of water used that is used in total of which 60 percent is safe and thanks to these huge pools we are seeing here so one, once more we are going to see the full the full process again first well, let's 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 uh, everything that conduct conducts the water flow in the direction longitudinal to the alignment of the of the of the of the canal longitudinal is called a culvert and every structure that conducts the water in the direction transverse to the to the to the alignment of the Panama Canal is called a conduit so once more you can see here the water flowing from the pools to the chamber then the water the water is rising and then once that 60 percent is complete then the levels are equalized using the main culverts from chamber to chamber and then the lock gates are open and then the chip transits So we have seen the animations, but uh, let's do the animations ourselves. Let's pretend we are droplets. We are, you know, water drops, and we are just sitting on the pools, in the pools, and then let's pretend that we will fill the chambers. So first, we will be taken by these inlets. We will uh, in in initiate our journey to the chambers from these inlets, and then we will have to cross these conduit valves. In this he here and once more we are now at the trifurcation where the conduit valves are installed and then we will continue our journey into the chambers once we pass the conduit valves here once more and we will go down via the trifurcation and then we will reach this point the yellow marks 
we are droplets remember so now we will be taken either to the east bank or to the west bank because the lateral ports are in both sides of the structures so what will happen is that half of the water will go to the east and the other half will go to the west culverts at, at both sides of the log chambers and then we will fill the secondary culverts which are culverts that are 66.5 meters by 6.5 meters and then from the secondary culverts the small ones here and we will the we will we will fill the chambers through the 2 by 2 meters lateral ports remember this is the one of the main differences between the 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 old 1914 Panama Canal and the third new set of new third set of locks once more remember there are secondary culverts and main primary culverts well this is how the water is exchanged from the primary culverts or the main ones to the secondary culverts when it's required to, to fill the chambers and also how the water flows from chamber to chamber via the primary culverts which are run from the lake to the ocean the secondary culverts are, are dead end culverts so they stop and end in each chamber so we speak we spoke a, lot, a little bit about redundancy but this is a more clear illustration of that this is this is the primary culverts remember we can see here the approximate 9 meters level from the uh, from one chamber to another one so the culvert bifurcates in two and everything is in two in this project that's called redundancy because we cannot afford to stop the operations of the Panama Canal so once more that flow is controlled by two pairs of culvert valves this really th these culverts run underneath the lock gates themselves this is the second pair and we can see here also the one the four on the other bank and finally but not the least the equalization valves because the final balancing of the levels of the waters between chamber and ad adjacent chambers is made by this by means of these equalization valves not via the lateral ports mm -hmm. so we are just approaching the final the lock gates the three the third main structure the lock gates for the 1914 panama canal were mitre gates mitre gates made of steel on the side all the gates were built on site we can see here the construction phase and we can see here them in operations this is a panamax ship 13 boxes across white 13 boxes remember that number so the new gates they are not mitre gates but they are rolling gates instead they were built by a subcontractor in italy Shimolai and they were brought with the special vessels the 16 of them to the Atlantic side and the eight that were uh, they, they were meant for the Pacific side were transported to the to the Pacific Ocean using the old locks so the old locks are still operative and running to give you an idea of the magnitude of this structure is this one is the biggest one in either uh, side Pacific or Atlantic and is 30 meters high is, is a 10 story building basically is 10 meters wide and 57 meters in length to give you an idea here you can see the marks between each mark is one meter and here there is a guy I I probably I'm not completely sure if you will manage to see him but it, the guy is the size of the, the red dot basic so rolling concept and loading and load limiting devices imagine oh 
sorry, but I forgot to tell you that the weight range of the gates is between 3.6 and 4.2 thousand tons each. So imagine that weight that will be subjected to different forces, the, the steel weight itself, plus the balanced water uh, forces, plus the unbalanced water forces, plus the dry outages when there is no water, so all, all, the, all the weight has to be carried by the locks gates themselves. Allow me to go back a little bit because I forgot one important detail. What you can see here and here are the buoyancy chambers of the gates that because buoyancy will help uh, the structures to, to carry on with the weight otherwise it won't be almost impossible and that because of the buoyancy the weight is reduced down to 10 to 20 percent depending on the of, of the gates so think about the gates about how really similar to slices of a chip hole and chips flow so the gates are floating. So that weight subject to different stresses and forces, of course, if you imagine yourself that you have to carry a really heavy weight and you need something like a wheelbarrow. So the principle is basically a wheelbarrow and of course with the help of the water buoyancy, uh, also with a, a spark of Dutch ingenuity for the process because the subcontractor in charge of the design of the gates was a Dutch company, Ivy Group. So this is basically a, a schematic of, of the gates and how, how they how they work. And then here's the water because water helps us with the buoyancy. And then imagine the handlers as this structure here and here. Then let's uh, take over our imagination to the how the weight is is um, is is um, loaded into the floor by a this column. Well, we we use the same concept like load columns in the gates, and then of course we have to transmit that load to the floor via the the, the wheel. And here are the wheels, and then. And then with the spring that helps us help the gates to 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 be put into the floor, basically, whenever there is a lateral force or a, 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 a trespassing of the of the of the forces threshold for each gate. This is a pulley system. So quiz time. Okay, very quickly we move to the last question because we are horribly running out of time, unfortunately. But again, this is one of those beautiful ones. What uh, name main differences between the old and the new Panama Canal? And again, you have a choice of four answers of which you are supposed to choose the best ones, one or ones. Sometimes it can be more. And in the meantime, yes, uh, here we go. Oscar, very briefly, are all the answers correct? Yes, indeed, they are. Okay, well, unfortunately, we run badly out of time because of the issue that we had before. But um, Oscar yeah. promised to finalize within the next one or two minutes. Otherwise, there's no time for questions anymore. Yeah, I think we have the... I, as a, a token of appreciation for your attendance, uh, we would like to take you to a virtual journey as we were just standing on the bridge of a ship. In this case, the ship is sailing southbound from the Atlantic to the Pacific side. So we are just transiting the, the new set of locks. We can see the gates always in two. And we can see that we are leaving the upper chamber. I mean, we are coming from the lake. We are then um, getting into the middle chamber 
we can see also the big pools we were speaking about before for recycling the water, the conduit valves, and then we can see the lower chamber once more, the final trip. So we can also here see the control building where all the operations are, are uh, followed. And then once more, it's, uh, you can see here that there is no space for the locomotives or the mules. So that's why we, 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 we use the tugboats for centering the chips in, in the middle of the chamber. And yeah, unfortunately, with this video and this final uh, virtual journey, we will have to leave you time for questions. Thank you very much. OK, Oscar, thank you so much for this uh, yeah, marvelous presentation. And uh, just to acknowledge, many of the pictures that you see in this presentation are made by the speaker himself. So you can believe he knows the project in all the little micro details. Uh, in the meantime, I wonder of any, whether any questions have come in so far. Um, I have not seen them too many, but there must be quite a few. Um, remember also, audience, that uh, there's no chance that we are going to be able to answer all the questions that you might have in the next uh, just about one, well, five more minutes that we have. But do write your questions, do send them by email or by Twitter, because I'm quite sure that Oscar is very interested in hearing your questions, because this is a long-term learning process. Uh, he may also, and he will also will learn from some of your questions that you have mentioned. No questions. No questions. OK, that is by itself not too much of a problem. Uh, Oscar, maybe I have a question already that um, we sort of discussed upon Uh, um, you have mentioned that the lake water is essential for this entire project and that one dam specifically is crucial to run the uh, Panama Canal, whether old or new. Can you say a few words about the potential vulnerability of the weak spots in this entire construction? Yes, it is. Katun Dam is the most vulnerable point. And not only that dam, because of course it holds Gatun Lake, and we really cannot afford to lose the Gatun Lake. But also important that was not mentioned because of the time is that in addition to that Gatun Dam, we have at least 20 saddle dams. I mean, much smaller dams that also hold the, hold the lake, and which are more or less equally important. Of course, the structures are not as big as Gatun Dam. But they also, we cannot afford either any failure of those saddle dams because you can imagine all the perimeter of the lake. Uh, we have at least 20 saddle dams to, to, to hold the, 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 the lake volume. Yeah, so water is crucial. Uh, obviously, Oscar, that has also very much to do with the issue of the water saving uh, approach taken in this particular construction project. Um, yeah, water is crucial. Water sits way above where it naturally would be, so saving is important. You talked about a 7% loss of water. How many times, if there would not be any, uh, any precipitation or water from elsewhere, how many times can that 7% loss be afforded? Is there a point that you can say, okay, but now we cannot really use any mm -hmm. losses more because we run out of water? Yeah, that's, uh, thank you for the question because it's a really excellent one. Uh, basically, the 7% is the 7%, we, we use 7% less water with this gate, with these chambers, than with the old ones. So, but the, 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 the bottom line of your question is like, yes, water is crucial. What, what, we, what we could do if it doesn't rain enough? Well, the first step is just and the maritime industry knows is we have to restrict the draft or the depth of the chips. For instance, when we start seeing the the the, um, the stumps of the of the old trees submerged by the Gatun Lake, that's the first signal of alarm. 
and then if 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 we don't have enough rain, the first step is we notify the maritime industry that it is going to be a draft or a debt of the ship's restriction. So that also means a loss of revenues to us because that means that we cannot charge or the tolls because of of the of the of the load is much lesser. And yeah, is uh, is uh, is it is true. That's why it's the water is the most important resource for this project and for 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 the life of, of, of Panamanian citizens themselves and it's also a good example of a really profitable and sustainable what uh, river basin development so it is possible to do that to to achieve sustainable development and to achieve progress by the by means of uh, the good use of the water water resources yeah, uh, I understand that there have not been any questions coming in so far, but I am a bit of loaded with questions. Has, in the same water context, uh, has any measures been necessary in Panama as a country to be even more secure with water management in partly, at least, in making sure that there is water in the country enough even if needed to pump it up to the to the to the lake area is that okay. one of the things that is being considered yeah one of uh, the studies from delft the delft hydraulics now called uh, diltares also uh, mentioned the possibility of in enhancing the the river basin by means of of not pumping because neither neither 1914 panama canal nor the new set of locks use any water pumping. There are no pumps in the projects, but by means of of uh, channels and tunnels, from, so we could uh, transfer water from adjacent basins to the to the Chagres basin. Okay, unfortunately, time is finished. We have to stop this uh, this this one hour alumni online seminar. Oscar, thanks once more for your fantastic presentation uh, of an extremely beautiful topic. In fact, uh, World Heritage Project number eight, we mentioned it yesterday. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the beautiful pictures. And also, thanks for the entire support staff, uh, the people sitting here in the room from the IT service. You can imagine that there is quite a bit of work to be done in order for this to run effectively. And even though we had a little hiccup, unfortunately, sorry for that. And for the people running behind to, to communicating with you in terms of uh, reception and in terms of questions. All of you, thank you for attending. Uh, there, is, there are more uh, online seminars coming up. You will be notified by our alumni officer, Maria Laura Sorrentino, who is the driving force between everything related to alumni in general in this institute and the alumni online seminar in particular. Thank you very much for your attention. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.